Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to begin by thanking our Brazilian hosts for uh, organizing a magnificent meeting and for providing the incentive and the initiative to allow the IAP to address this issue and to consider how science might be part of a call for action. I'm also here because the Royal Society and I'm a fellow of the British Academy, so I'm representing actually all four of the UK academies, the Royal Society, the British Academy, the Academy of Medical Sciences and the Royal Academy of Engineering. And they're all forming together around this topic. And it's actually rather exciting that the four great British academies have begun to look at the whole issue of how science should address not just the issue of poverty of education, but the wider issue, as Jeff would be pleased to hear, sustainable development goals. And in fact, one of the reasons why I'm here is the Royal Society specifically asked me to take to you all that they want to have a much greater engagement with the science side of things in relation to policy and to institutions and indeed to the public at large across a wide range of publics right through the globe. And, and also because I involved myself with the parliamentary committee called the Environment Audit Committee, which is one of the legislative committees that specifically addresses sustainable development goals and wants to see them adequately not only brought into the European system, not just the UK system, because we are still a part of the European Union, though this may change, who knows. Um, but also because, in fact, the parliamentary people are very, very interested indeed about sustainability being part of a new scene in the way in which Parliament is engaging with the future of the planet. So that gives me a sense of why I'm here and why I would, I would like you to be encouraged by the way these academies look at this. But also the academies are signed up to Future Earth, which is a, a new global science for sustainable development. And I'm leading the UK element of that, which is another reason why I'm here. And we're now reaching out to the European Union and future Earth committees are forming all over the European Union. And also they're beginning to stretch out across the globe. And I think one of my colleagues or two later on this morning will address that. So Geoffrey should also be very encouraged that this additional science is coming in. Now what does this mean for science? And essentially the call for action I'm encouraging IAP to consider is to set up a mechanism for looking at what this kind of science might address and how it might run itself over the next 10 years in relation to the issues that Jeffrey has raised and we're all concerned about. And if I could start with three observations which reinforce but also to extend Jeffrey's analysis. The first one is that if you look at social, economic and environmental and governmental, they're all in turmoil. And in fact, a lot of the past conditions under which we look at these things are no longer relevant. So the, the base case for economic, social, environmental, and governmental isn't the base case that we can rely on to jump off from. So we're actually launching ourselves from a bog rather than from solid ground, conceptually speaking. And that's not a very good basis for launching. But also, in the comments that Jeffrey was making, there was an implicit understanding that actually there's a fifth dimension here, which he broadly called culture. How people think, how people react, what they believe in. Not just in terms of themselves, but also in terms of the social networks in which they operate. And I can't help but think that when we look at biodiversity loss or climate change or other things which are on the Rockstrom diagram, when it comes down to it, there are two really big, powerful factors behind this. One is our own behavior, because every time we move, eat, consume, do anything, we're creating a global consequence. We are, in that sense, global citizens by our action. But also our own outlook. Do we think about these things? Do we care about these things? Does it affect the way we consume energy? Affect the way we eat? Does it affect the way we relate to each other? If you see people doing things which are clearly non-sustainable, you say nothing or you get involved in some form of awareness raising. These are hugely important questions in a society that needs to address the kinds of challenges we've been talking about now. So the, 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 the role that I would be asking the IEP to consider is a much wider role around the cultural um, dimensions of morality, of behavior, and the second set of influences, which is the huge institutions of government, regulation, business, marketing, and indeed social peer group pressure, because we are, in our different ways, the product of our own internal values, but also how we think we are perceived by others, and we behave in ways which we expect ourselves to be appreciated by others. These are all factors which influence the way in which sustainable development goals will play out. And that's why I think the emerging science has to take that into account. So my first point 
is we need to extend this into government culture and to the way in which people actually conceive and conceptualize their moral position for the next 20 years. The second issue is that we are now reaching a stage where the learning process of a modern society is becoming destabilized by actually what is called a new poverty. It's not the poverty of the old poverty. I touched on this in our discussion yesterday. It's an increasing the inequality element that Jeffrey gave a lot of attention to, which I think is incredibly important, is creating not just a new group of, relatively speaking, poorer people, but people who are becoming less connected to society. They feel disillusioned. They feel unfairly treated. They feel that society is letting them down. They're having less of a sense of, why should I bury about a future society? Why should I care myself about sustainable development goals if the way the society seems to be operating is giving small amounts of vast quantities of money to those who are already in power who don't seem to want to distribute it? When we have an economic and political system which doesn't take natural capital and social capital seriously, it doesn't, it doesn't identify with it, it doesn't measure it, it doesn't incorporate it into accounts in any way, and where we can see all around us damage to our environments and damage to our neighbors, neighbors being biblical, i.e. anyone on the planet, that is actually not compensated for, and not only that is undermining the capacity of these systems to be strong in relation to the challenges that Jeffrey and others are raising. So the second issue, therefore, is that we are, we are mining out our natural and social capital in a way which is actually desperately dangerous because it's creating a lack of capacity. The third issue, and this is the two hopeful sides, which I really want to stress with you, is first of all, we're beginning to think about retraining the next generation of scientists. So they have certain qualities we think are indispensable for the quality of this next generation of scientists. The first of these is that they are comfortable with interdisciplinarity. It isn't an issue that they need to say, I'm an interdisciplinary person. It means to say that they can move between one level of discipline and another. Nothing to say or take away from what Michael had been saying. Disciplinarity is still a vital part of the building block of science, but interdisciplinarity strengthens it and gives it flexibility and adaptability, and it's those qualities that we need in the next generation of scientists who are flexible about how they perceive things and how they measure things. The second thing we're trying to do is to get youngsters, all of our society, all graduates, not just graduates in environmental sciences or development studies, but actually across the campus, whether in English or in mathematics or music or whatever, to have a quality of leadership which is allowing them to be citizens of the next generation, to have a sense of moral responsibility, to be prepared to work with others, to create conditions which add social value when you're doing what you're doing rather than detract from it, and to recognize and appreciate the natural world is an intrinsic part of our well-being. The third thing we're creating is a sense of leadership, which means that people have that capacity to take those ideas elsewhere and not be swayed and this is quite very critical for Jeffrey's presentation, not be swayed when people say, it can't be done, I think what you're talking about is crazy, this is not going to happen in my lifetime. Those are the kinds of answers you often get from what I call the established mindsets, which even though they're small, Jeffrey, they're still, whether we like it or not, tough to break. But if people can say, no, no, that's not a world I want to see, that's not a world I want to engage in, then it helps that process of actually arresting the relevant change. So that credibility of the scientific argument, which is deeply rooted in society, becomes more influential. And finally, we need to reach out to the next generation. So we are now spending a lot of time with the generation of 18 to 11-year-olds, the people who in 10 years' time will be the next generation of citizens coming out of university schools and so on. And they're the people who, have, with things stand now, are actually going to be very seriously affected by what's going on in the world that we see. None of which I'm going to repeat, because Jeffrey did a brilliant job of breaking it down. But we need to prepare that generation for being able to handle this and to grasp with it and understand it and start to change the basis around these things work. So my c conclusion, for what it's worth in this short presentation, is one, inside the call for action, I would think the scientific community should address the diminution, the destruction, the undermining of social and natural capital. Measure it better. Make sure that it's understood by everybody, not just by business or by the science community or by policymakers, but through the fabric of the whole of the world, global human family. Because some parts of social capital, particularly in the poor world, are incredibly important for stabilizing what would otherwise be very destructive outcomes. 
We tend to underestimate how resilient communities are often best found in very poor communities. This is not an excuse for maintaining poverty, it's an excuse to have the admiration for the way social capital has a role in the changing world we're in. But also because I think a model should be in the business model that the undermining of the natural capital, which is not in Jeffrey's thinking, but I'm sure it's in there in terms of his presentation and his thinking, is that actually there needs now to be a depletion tax or levy. There needs to be mechanisms whereby we invest in natural and social capital as part of the business case. We need the scientific community to directly engage in institutional design so that there is never such a thing as development that diminishes natural and social capital. Now, in the short run, that's going to be a tough thing to sort out. But it is exactly what science should do. So my first call, therefore, is improve our scientific understanding of natural and social capital, integrate it better with models of development, and then devise governmental and social systems which incentivize it and, and give it resources which become the basis around which we develop the new form of society that we've been talking about in this meeting all week. The second big theme, and I'll leave it at this point because I think it's very important, is that I would love the academies of sciences, especially the IAP, to address how that science can be created, how it can be extended, how it can be brought into the world of academia and science generally, across the academies, so that the academies are seen to be championing this kind of thing, and also because it has to engage directly with communities. So I'd not love to see the academies spend much more time with direct negotiation with community organizations, with the agents of change in any society that we're in because they're identifiable in this modern age, and with the ability of encouraging social media to take on board the kinds of moral thinking that need to be addressed in terms of the next generation of what we will really call sustainability citizens. This is the breed of humanity we need within 20 or 30 years. Otherwise, frankly, we're going to have a great deal of problem. And our job as scientists is to create conditions that are make that kind of transformation not only possible across the globe in very different cultural settings, but also something that when people come out of it, they won't even realize that they're sustainable citizens. They are just simply people doing the right kind of thing by themselves and by the planet. And therefore, they are what we now call all new, the new people, the new humanity. And they don't have to think it through in some tortuous way, which is what we're doing in this meeting today. That's the, that's the ultimate goal. And I'd like to think that by 2050, which is the key turning point here, that will be the way the academies have led that change. This is my message. I hope it, we can come to something uh, before this meeting is out. Thank you very much for your attention.